Okay, good morning everyone. We are continuing our class on giving a defense for our hope. And the first part of this quarter has been addressing, is Christianity true? The second part has been about, is Christianity good? And since I have changed the syllabus so many times, I actually lost track of where I was supposed to be. So, so I'm doing something this morning I wasn't even supposed to do. I, I was supposed to do, is Christianity homophobic this morning? That was the plan, but unfortunately I got confused and thought that I was supposed to be doing this topic. So, uh, so I did all my preparations and it was like Thursday afternoon when I realized that it was way too late to go back. So we will not skip that topic. We will not say, hey, we're not going to talk about is Christianity homophobic. We're just going to move it. It'll be the last class of the quarter, sort of switching places with this. This morning we'll talk about presuppositional apologetics. Um, before we do, let's go to our Father in prayer. God, we praise your name. We thank you so much for sending Jesus, who was willing to um, give up everything in exchange for us and for our souls so that we might be saved. We are forever grateful to you for that. We pray that we will live with grace and with joy in our hearts and that we'll share that with those around us, that we will invite people to know this incredible love that only you have to share with us. And Father, that we will be reflections of Jesus in the world by denying ourselves, taking up our cross and following you. Help us this morning as we learn another approach to try to reach the lost around us um, in love and gentleness as we try to bring them to the truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So to start off, I want to point out that there are four basic approaches to apologetics, to giving a defense for the hope that is in us. So far this quarter, we have used three of these four approaches. Approach number one is, it's far more reasonable to believe the God of the Bible exists than that he doesn't. This is what we spent the first 15 classes of this quarter building a case for presenting evidence to make this case. Secondly, it's far better for society and for us personally to believe that the God of the Bible exists. This is what we have spent the last five class periods covering. Approach number three, the existence of the God of the Bible is the best explanation for our experience of reality. Now, this is pretty similar to approach number one. It's just that instead of presenting facts from science uh, and history and all that stuff, we're, we're really appealing to our shared human experience. That, that humans just, we have this yearning, this common sense that there's something beyond this world, which is why humans throughout history have always worshipped something beyond this world, and, and we have a, a common sense of a desire for justice, and we experience love and, and things like that, and God is really the best explanation for that. Now, here's the approach we haven't used yet, and this is the presuppositional approach, and this, this subject, it can be kind of complicated. If it's the first time you've ever heard this before, I, I've tried as best I can to present it in a clear manner, but if it's the first time you've ever heard it, um, you might need to maybe go back and listen to the, the class again, and there are other resources as well on this. And hopefully I'll just make it so clear that you just won't have any questions at all. I'm going to do my best. Approach number four, it is impossible for the God of the Bible not to exist because without him all of our thoughts are nonsensical. This argues that the presuppositional approach, and this is where it gets its name, it argues that one must presuppose or assume the existence of God in order to make sense of anything. So atheists, for instance, will claim that they don't believe in God because Christianity isn't logical or scientific or moral, but logic, science, and morality are nonsensical concepts without God. So they are presupposing his existence simply by raising the objection. Now, I'm going to go into more detail you know, on this, but I'm just giving the big picture. The goal of the presuppositional approach is to help them see that this. And this approach, you, I mean, all of our approach should be done with love and gentleness. I think this one especially, if you don't do this with an extreme amount of love and respect for this person, uh, it can get ugly pretty fast because this is a very powerful thing that can just really flip a, a person's entire worldview upside down in a matter of seconds. So what is a presupposition? Presuppositions are 
the basic assumptions, beliefs, and expectations that guide our thoughts and actions, that they form the foundation for our life. And some of them are so foundational that we don't even think about them. For instance, we all operate on the presupposition that we need oxygen to survive. And so I don't have to think about breathing. I just instinctively do that. I try not to hold my head underwater for too long. Okay, The presuppositionalist will point out that atheists live as if they presuppose that the laws of logic are universal and transcendent and that we can trust our minds to use our reason and deduction to draw sound conclusions. They live by the assumption that we can trust science because of the uniformity of nature and the unchanging laws that govern our universe. And though they may say they don't believe in objective morality, they live as if they presuppose some standard of right and wrong, of moral and immoral, and usually, unfortunately, they're judging the God of the Bible by that standard and calling him immoral. Okay. Now, if you can expose these underlying assumptions and explain to them those assumptions are only possible if you presuppose the existence of God, it can help them to see that they need God in order to make sense of anything in this world. Now, when you start to look into the presuppositional approach, here's what you're going to run into, and I'm just, I'm, I, I have to talk about this uh, because you're just going to run into it. Unfortunately, presuppositionalists reject the first three approaches with atheists. A presuppositionalist would argue that not only are approaches one through three not the best approach with atheists, it is actually blasphemous to use those approaches. Now, they will say it's perfectly fine and good to use those three approaches with Christians, that it's a great way to bolster the faith of Christians. They're not against using evidences for, for that reason. Uh, but, but they actually believe if they're in a conversation with an atheist, it is not right for Christians to use approaches one through three. Now, I do not believe that's what the Bible teaches. Okay? Uh, I, I disagree with what they're saying, but I'm bringing it up because, number one, you're just going to run into it if you look deeper into this. And number two, I think that their criticisms against those three approaches are worth listening to. I think they raise some very, very interesting and, and true objections. Okay, so let me tell you the four reasons why they reject approaches one through three, which, you know, this is very personal for us because we've just spent a whole quarter on approaches one through three, and now they're rejecting them. Well, why is that? Why would they say something like that? Well, because they would say, number one, atheists many times will simply reinterpret the evidence based on their worldview. So, for instance, we see this happening to Jesus. Matthew 12, a demon-possessed man who was blind and mute was brought to Jesus, and he healed him, so that the mute man spoke and saw. And all the crowds were amazed, and they were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, well, he casts out demons by Beelzebul, the, the ruler of the demons. So, in, in the Pharisaic worldview, whoever the Messiah was, it couldn't be Jesus, because Jesus does not fit their presuppositions, their preconceived notions about what the Messiah should look like. And so when faced with clear evidence, Jesus just cast the demon out of this guy, the evidence doesn't matter because they just reinterpret it and give a different explanation for that evidence than that Jesus is actually God. So presuppositionalists would say if you try to use approaches one through three with atheists, and you give them all this evidence about the universe had a beginning, and you know, we can trust uh, the irreducible complexity of the cell, and you know, that we can trust the biblical accounts and all of that, most of the time they'll just re, uh, reinterpret it to fit their assumptions. Uh, there, there's in one book, he told the story of a man who believed he was dead. And the, you know, the family said, look, you need to go to a doctor, because the family wanted the doctor to prove him wrong, you know, to just help him see that he's not a dead person. So he goes to the doctor, and the doctor asks him a question. He says, uh, do dead people bleed? You know, and the guy says, well, no, you know, they don't have circulation, and their heart's not pumping and all that. And so the doctor pricks his finger, and you know, blood comes out, and the guy looks at his finger, and he says, huh, I guess dead men really do bleed. <laughs> so. It's a silly story. I don't even know if this is true or not, right? But, but the point is, he's, he's simply reinterpreting the evidence to fit what matches his, his worldview, all right? And I think that is a, 
when we're doing apologetics, you got to keep that in mind. That's a fair criticism. That's biblical. That's exactly what happened in the Bible. All right. Secondly, Christians should not pretend to be neutral. Jesus says, he who is not with me is against me. He who does not gather with me scatters. So presuppositionists will say many times, when you take the evidential approach with atheists, you're essentially pretending to be neutral and you're saying, okay, let's start from the premise that maybe God doesn't exist. And, and then we'll just sort of work our way through the evidence and, and prove that he does. And the presuppositionists will say, yeah, that's, that's not how Christians should operate. Now, now we could say in response, okay, that's not really fair. Because you don't have to do apologetics that way. You don't have to say, well, maybe God doesn't exist. You can tell an atheist, I'm absolutely convinced God exists, and here's the evidence that, that convinces me of that. But here is the, pres the presuppositional response. Okay? They would say this. When an atheist wants to talk to us, they approach us with a set of rules and expectations for the conversation. Like, we need to use rational, logical argumentation, we need to appeal to science to establish truth, and we need to be honest with our statements and not lie to one another. Now, what Christians will do with approaches one through three is we'll, we'll treat those rules as if they're completely neutral territory, and we'll, we'll start to play by their rules. We'll start presenting evidences using rational, log logical argumentation. We'll appeal to science, and, and we'll be honest. But the presuppositionalist says, hold up, time out here. Those ground rules are not neutral at all because they're only possible if God exists. Without the existence of God, there is no basis for reason, for logic, for science, or the need to be honest. So just by playing by their rules, we are conceding to them that reason, logic, science, and morality belong to the atheists when they do not. They are owned by God. So the presuppositionists will say, instead of playing by their rules and giving them evidence, they will say, even your request for me to give you evidence based on reason, logic, and science is proof that God exists. Because without him, you wouldn't be able to make sense of evidence at all. Now, I'll explain that more later. I'm just trying to lay the groundwork for why they disagree okay, with these approaches. Thirdly, <clears throat> Christians should not present God as a probability. The basic verse that we always use for giving a defense or an apologia is 1 Peter 3.15. And we always focus on the second part of the verse, which is always be ready to make a defense. But we skip over the first part sometimes, which says, sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. Always being ready to make a defense for everyone who asks you to give an, an account for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Uh, presuppositions take issue with approaches one through three because it presents God as the most probable or likely explanation, but the Bible doesn't present God that way. Peter tells us, before we can give a defense, we have to sanctify Jesus as Lord in our hearts. And honestly, I think this is a valid approach, or a valid criticism, rather, of the traditional approach. Because we sometimes will act neutrally just to avoid conflict. And we'll say things like, you know, I, I think God is the best explanation for the evidence, but, you know, I could be persuaded otherwise. Or I think the probability of God existing is higher than the probability that he doesn't. And I see why we might do that, because being dogmatic might turn some people off, Okay, but, but the presuppositions will say, yeah, but the Bible is very dogmatic about God's existence. He's not the great probability. He's the great I am. <laughs> and presuppositions argue, and this is where, this, is where th this part gets pretty deep here, so stick with me on this. All right? it's, very, it's very interesting, though. Presuppositions argue, if Christianity is only true because of the evidence for it, and not because of the self-attesting authority of God, then what happens if some tragedy strikes and maybe I lose a child or I lose a spouse? And then I treat that as evidence that God doesn't exist. The presuppositions would say, if as a Christian, I could be convinced that God didn't exist, if some evidence for his non-existence was discovered, then my own reason is the ultimate standard of truth, not God. And that puts us in, in the same boat with atheists who also believe that their reason is the ultimate standard of truth. The presuppositionist says God is true because he says he is, and without him we wouldn't even be able to make sense of the concept of truth at all. So he's not a probability, he's a necessity. 
Very deep, very, very, very interesting. And then finally, they would argue lack of evidence isn't the real problem because of Romans chapter 1. Romans 1 says, The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them. For God made it evident to them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. Interestingly, in the Greek, without an apologia, without a defense. Same word used in 1 Peter 3.15. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. So presuppositionists would say the real problem of atheists it's not lack of evidence. They already know God. They're just suppressing the knowledge of him through their sin. And sin has corrupted their minds and their hearts to become fools. Psalm 14.1 says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And foolishness in the Bible is not about a lack of intelligence. There are some brilliant, very high IQ fools in this world. Foolishness in the Bible is about moral stubbornness that refuses to admit the truth even though they know it. This is why you could ask some atheists, if I could convince you through evidence that Christianity is true, would you become a Christian? And they will still say no. So presuppositionists say, well, then it's a waste of time to present evidence to atheists because they already have plenty of evidence given to them through creation and through their own conscience. Now, I disagree that it's wrong or that it's a waste of time to use these approaches. In fact, I think approaches one through three can be fantastic if you have an open-minded atheist. If you have an atheist that really, they want to have a real conversation, they want, they're, they're genuinely wondering, how can you believe in God? I mean, well, there's no evidence for that. And then you can show them, yeah, there is evidence for that. But if you get a very aggressive atheist, a very hostile atheist, you can give them evidence till you're blue in the face. They're going to they're gonna laugh at you. And they're going to reinterpret it and say, well, you know, that's not what that means. And there's another explanation for that. And I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine years ago about the resurrection of Jesus. And I went through all the evidence we went through on the, the swoon theory and the hallucination theory and the wrong tomb theory and how all these things and how the only thing that makes sense is the resurrection of the dead. And I said to him, I said, well, what, what do you say to all that? You know? And he says, well, I don't really know. All I know is that any explanation at all makes more sense than that he rose from the dead. So you're just like, now what are you going to do? In the case of atheists that clearly have no interest in evidence, I think the presuppositional method is fantastic for that scenario. And we're going to talk about the actual method in a moment. But first, I want to open it up to you all. Do you have any questions or comments? That was pretty... That was a lot of stuff that we covered there. All right, Tim and then Tom and then Debbie. I was just <clears throat> going to kind of confirm what you said about the first three and the fact that Jesus did cast demons out and the fact that these demons were done in the first place in front of people who weren't going to believe when they saw it, it still was done. Yes. Um, and some t that's what you do. You, you, you see who's going to believe it, who's not going to believe it, and you move on. But he definitely did the, the act even though they didn't believe it. So he saw things like that as, no, you show them the evidence and, um, and you move on. Yeah, yeah. And if, they're, and if they reject the evidence, then that only further shows them why they have no excuse, you know, before God. Yeah, Tom? This may be where you're going, but um, I've heard people that start with the question that you just posed as, if I could prove that Christianity were true, would you believe it? Mm. Um, if the answer is, Yes, then it's a it's a head issue. If it's no, then it's a heart issue. Yes, um, and one is manageable or can be proceeded along. The other one usually cannot. Yeah, really good. I mean, and we talked about how there are different. I think three main barriers to people becoming a Christian. One is an intellectual barrier. One is an emotional barrier, and the other is a volitional barrier, a matter of the will. It's just like. Yeah, I believe it's true intellectually, and I don't have any problems with it emotionally, but I just don't want to submit to God, because okay, that's a volitional thing. So, so everybody has a different reason. Um, and that's why I just, I think it's, and it's a whole longer discussion about, you know, defending those three approaches against the people from the presuppositional side that attack them. But I just think it, we have to be careful just saying, like, well, that, that method is sinful, right? You can't use that method. Like, no, the, God presents evidence all the time in, in the Bible. 
Yeah, Debbie. Oh, I was just going to ask if you could repeat what you said as mm. far as the moral foolishness with your definition. Oh, yes. Yeah. So uh, foolishness in the Bible is not about intelligence. It's about moral stubbornness that refuses to admit the truth even when they know it, even when they know the truth. That, that's really what folly is about. And, and obviously, you have to be careful. You, you call an atheist a fool. Like, that's immediately like fighting words. Because in our culture, fool just means you're an idiot, right? And that's not, that's not true. You could be talking to, you know, an MIT professor, right, who is not an idiot. That guy is an MIT professor. But he's a fool, biblically, if he says there is no God. Uh, Herb? <clears throat> so I've got... <laughs> I'm doing the back and forth on this with you. Okay, sure. Um, so what came to mind to me was Proverbs 1-7. Which uh, we're getting to. Yes, good. Oh, sorry. That is the presuppositions favorite verse. Go ahead, read it. Go ahead? Yep, go ahead okay. and read it. Well, the first part says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Mm -hmm. but that was not the part I was focusing on. Oh, interesting. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Good. So that would give credence to what you were saying, and I think what Tom was saying, that if... If they're just going to uh, despise wisdom and instruction, then it's not going to matter what you say. And yes. so you made a good point. If there's an open mind there, yes, yes but they're just being foolish. They're being fools. Yes. On the other hand, <laughs> I can't find the verse that says, you know, if we're not raised from the dead, then we're all, all men most foolish. What is that? Oh, yeah, First Corinthians 15. 15, yeah. okay. Yeah. Well, isn't that kind of doing what the presuppositions don't like? It says... If we haven't done this, and if this, is that, or am I being inconsistent here? Oh, what, like he's presenting evidence for the, for yes. the resurrection? Sure, yes. yeah. I, yeah, I, and again, like, they have answers for all that. It is super <laughs> deep. I've heard debates on oh, this. And, sorry. Oh, it's, it's such a huge rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, but, but that is interesting. You make the point, yeah, that's what a fool is. It's somebody who, it's not just someone who doesn't have wisdom and instruction. That would be someone who's not intelligent. They don't have wisdom or instruction. It's someone who despises wisdom and doesn't want it. That, that's, that's the folly there. Uh, and that is interesting you bring that verse up because we're going to get into that verse, the first part, later. All right, go ahead, Jason, then we'll move on. I, sorry, I, I like rabbit holes. Oh, um, don't go too deep. Don't go too deep, please. So, no, no, no. It, it, it just occurred to me, though, that, that presuppositionalists would probably have an issue with how Paul... Uh, uh, presented the gospel on Mars Hill, where he said he, he looks at all these statues to gods and he says, "I see you're very religious," and he never said, "You're idiots. You're worshiping rocks. You're not. You know, you've made up your own gods." He doesn't say that. He says, "I see you have a temple to the unknown god. Let me tell you about him." And and and, and so you see, I, I I think that presuppositionalists in some ways are ignoring that. <laughs> style of teaching that, that we find in Scripture that is not straight out, we're going to condemn you for being an idiot, but hey, let's talk about this, and let me reason with you. And that's what Paul did on Mars Hill. He reasoned with them. Okay, all right. So let me, let me clarify that um, the presuppositionists would not... Would would not call somebody an idiot. Like, they would, they would, do, they would do what Paul did. Like, they, they would actually, you know, treat people with kindness or whatever... Uh, because what they're, what the presuppositionist is doing is they're saying, look, you, you actually can use logic and reason, right? You you can trust your your mind and science and 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 all that. It's just you're not understanding. The only reason you can do that is because God exists. So so they're not calling atheists, you know, dumb or whatever. And, and of course, they have an answer about Acts 17 and Mars Hill. The presuppositional say that Paul's using presuppositional apologetics there as well. So anyway, it's, like I said, mm, man, I'm not going to go there. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so here, here is the three-step approach. Okay. And it, anyway, so I make it sound so simple, but it, it's, a little, it's a little tricky. Okay. Number one, okay, explain how any appeals to reason, science, and morality are nonsensical without God. So let's start with reason first. The problem with atheism is that there is no ultimate justification for trusting our ability to reason properly. And that is because if you have descended from fish and from monkeys, and really all that's happening in your brain are just chemical reactions, then on what basis do you trust your reasoning? 
the, Charles Darwin actually admitted this is a really huge problem with evolution. It was called Darwin's horrid doubt. That's sort of the nickname that's, that's come up with because how do we know, if evolution is true, how do we know if our brains evolve properly? That's a matter of faith, right? That's, that was totally unguided. There was no intelligence behind the formation of our brains and all that. And so how can you tell if, if we can trust our, our reason? Now, uh, let's see, let me click one more time. Now, an atheist might respond, we can trust our reasoning because we can use logic and, and make deductions about truth, and then you can respond. So are you saying that the reason you know we can trust our reasoning is because of your reasoning? Because your reasoning convinces you that we can? That's a circular argument, you see? Uh, because how do you know that you are reasoning properly about the trustworthiness of your reason? Uh, here's an illustration for the chemical reaction thing. If you shake up a bottle of Coke and a bottle of Sprite and you open them and they just start fizzing, you know, that's just a chemical reaction, right? So would we say that the Coke is fizzing truth and the Sprite is fizzing falsehood? We wouldn't, we wouldn't say that because you cannot get truth, logic, and reason from chemical reactions. And without God, that's all that is happening in our brains is a chemical fizzing reaction. Where do you get truth and reason from that? See, you're, what you're doing is you're trying to show them, again in love, that their worldview cannot account for reason, logic, and truth. But our world, you can. Because God is logical and intelligent, and he created our minds to process information and to form sound conclusions. Now, again, to be clear, this is what I was saying earlier. I said it a little too prematurely, but you're not calling atheists unreasonable or dumb. You're simply pointing out that they live as if they can assume our reasoning can be trusted. But their atheistic worldview, it doesn't give them any basis to live by that assumption. Science, case okay, science. Another problem with atheism is that there's no ultimate justification for our ability to do science. When we do science, we are assuming that the future will be like the past. We are assuming that the laws of nature will be the same tomorrow as they were today. But in a purposeless, unguided, unintelligent universe that came together by chance, there's no basis for assuming the laws of gravity won't change and we aren't just gonna float off into space tomorrow. In a universe without God, how do we know the laws holding the universe together won't just completely change? Now, an atheist might say, well, we know because they, you know, they haven't changed in the past. But really, that's just an argument from likelihood. You're just saying, well, you know, because they've never changed before, like it's, it's most likely, most, that's a probability argument. It's most probable that they're not going to change in the future. But a worldview without God doesn't allow us to know that with certainty. And therefore, the entire basis for conducting science could just fall apart at any time. Morality. If we're all bags of meat and protoplasm, how can an atheist say it's wrong for one bag of protoplasm to shoot holes in another bag of protoplasm? How can someone who evolved from primordial soup and purely physical, unguided, purposeless processes call someone else who evolved from those same processes evil? Without God, there is no good or evil. It's just stuff I don't like. It's personal preference. It's maybe some shared communal understanding of utility or getting along or something, but there's no, there's no objective morality. So here is where we are. Because the atheist can't know that they can trust their reason, and they can't know that the laws of nature will continue to be uniform in the future, and they can't know whether something is evil or not, you can ask them this question, is it fair to say, since you can't know any of this for sure, that you could be wrong about everything you claim to know? Now, I've seen interviews all over YouTube with people using this approach, and many atheists will admit this. They'll say, absolutely, of course I could be wrong about everything I claim to know. Um, they'll still say, well, we know some things. Okay, but again, that's impossible without God. But they'll still say we know something. But they will admit, yeah, some of them will say, yeah, we could, we could just be in the matrix right now. You know, this could all just be a big computer program. We, we don't really know if any of this is real at all. And here's, this, is the, this is the crux of this approach. Because if that is the case, you have given up knowledge completely because you cannot know anything for certain. If I look at a building 
And I say, that building is 50 feet tall, but I could be wrong. Do I know the height of that building? <laughs> I don't know it. I don't know it with certainty if I could, if it's possible that I could be wrong. Um, so what that means is, in that case, I don't really have knowledge. All I have is speculation. And maybe, maybe there's some educated basis for that. Maybe I'm just really familiar with buildings in the past and whatever. But, but I, I don't know the height of that building. I don't have knowledge. All I have is speculation. And this is where the atheistic worldview takes us to a point where we cannot know anything at all. Because anything we claim to know, there's no basis to trust that knowledge. Now, again, the atheist will protest, of course, and say, we absolutely can know things. We can know that 2 plus 2 is 4. We can go and measure the height of that building and know it. And you agree with them. Of course you can. I'm not saying you can't know anything. I'm saying your worldview can't account for the fact that you know things. And so what you do is you agree with them that we can know things with 100% certainty, but you explain that's only possible if you presuppose the existence of God. Otherwise, you don't know if you can trust your reasoning, so you can't know anything for sure, and it makes our entire existence and even our very conversations about truth and knowledge nonsensical. Now, if you're dealing with a, a very aggressive atheist who you know, they just they don't want to listen, and they're just maybe they're just launching attacks at God, and you know they're calling you know God. He he promoted slavery, and he's evil, and he's immoral, and all that. You can simply say, look, I hear you, but you've admitted you could be wrong about everything that you claim to know. So couldn't you be wrong about that? And if they say, well, well, let me let me go further than that. Not not just asking, couldn't you be wrong about that? You can actually say. All of your attacks about Christianity not being logical or moral, like the, all of your attacks are nonsensical in your view. Now, if they say, okay, but, but how do you know if your view, you know, you're just saying that, right? Like, how do you know you're right that, about the God's existence? Well, you can just tell them because God has to exist for us to even be having a discussion about truth and knowledge at all. And we'll get to that in step two, why, you know, why we're saying that. Okay, but this is, this is the approach. Step two is this. Explain why that's the case, right? So far, we just sort of made the claim, right? Explain why this is the case, that we must presuppose God to know anything with certainty. Let's go again through reason, science, and, and morality. Reason, Christianity, the Christian worldview has ultimate justification for trusting our reasoning. Because it means we're made by a God who is logical and intelligent, he is the source of all knowledge and certainty. He gave us the ability to use the laws of logic to form sound conclusions and to know things for certain. And this is where that verse comes in that Herb read from earlier, Proverbs 1 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. We must presuppose the existence of God in order to have true knowledge. You must. It's not, not even presupposing the existence of God, but this is saying to actually fear the Lord, to actually repent. And this is what the presuppositionists argue, that the classical approach tries to use evidence to bring, to bring a person to the point of repentance so that they will have the knowledge of God. But the presuppositionist says, no, the person has to repent first before they can be honest with any knowledge of God that you give them. Otherwise, they're going to twist you know, the evidence that you give them. You have to start by believing in God in order to have knowledge. Uh, Proverbs 2.6, the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He is the source of it all. Jesus, same thing. Colossians 2, attaining, uh, that you may attain to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, notice the contrast between rooting our knowledge in Christ and rooting our knowledge in human Understanding, he says, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of this world, rather than according to Christ. So Christ has the key to all knowledge about everything, how the universe works, why we're here, what our purpose is, where we came from, how we should live, why we can trust science and logic and reason. And without him, we're left with empty deception and human philosophy that has no real knowledge or answers. Uh, science, the existence of God is the only basis for an orderly, structured universe with unchanging laws of nature that govern everything and that are expected to continue to be unchanging. 
Colossians 1.17 says, Jesus is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. Jesus is the one holding the universe together with His power, keeping the laws of nature from changing. Hebrews 1.3, He is the radiance of His glory, the exact representation of God's nature, and upholds all things by the word of His power. And then, of course, morality. The existence of God is the only basis for calling something truly evil or immoral. Otherwise, it's just personal preference. Psalm 119 um, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Jesus will later say, no one is good but God. He's the standard of goodness. And anything opposed to the goodness of God is evil. Which means there is such a thing as objective good and evil in the Christian worldview. Um, okay, I think Okay, I think what I'll do is I'll go ahead and finish. And then we should have like five to seven minutes left of time if you guys want to ask questions. Um, finally, step three is call them to repentance and faith in Jesus. Now, here's another really deep concept. It's, it's very, very, very interesting. I just wanted to share it with you. Um, it is not just that atheists can't know anything for certain because evolution gives them no basis for trusting their reasoning and because it's all just chemical reactions in the brain. That's part of it. But even if they could account for reasoning in their worldview, they would still have to admit our knowledge as human beings is incredibly limited. Even if an atheist could trust his reasoning, he still can't know anything for sure because right around the corner, there could be some new discovery in the universe that proves that we were wrong about something. The only way to have certainty about anything is for us to know everything. Think about that. The only way to have certainty about anything is to know everything. Because if I say, well, I'm certain about this, and then next week we you know, discover something that shows that I'm, I'm wrong, well, then my certainty just kind of goes out the window. <clears throat> my certainty is, is an illusion at that point. Um, well, as Christians, we don't claim to know everything ourselves. We just claim to know the one who does. And this is why presuppositions will say, you, you need a revelational epistemology. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge, where, where you get knowledge from, where does knowledge come from? They say ultimate knowledge has to come from God. It has to be rooted in him because he's the only one who knows everything. So Jesus, the one who knows all things, he says to the atheists that the reason they don't believe in God is not because of a lack of evidence, but because of their sin against him that brought them to the point where they have no knowledge, just empty speculations. But of course, Jesus loved them so much, he came to die to not only save their souls, but to redeem their thoughts and bring them to, to the knowledge of the truth. So this is how Paul words it. Um, whoops, sorry. There we go. Uh, the Lord's bondservant, 2 Timothy 2, must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Again, the classical approach uses the knowledge of evidence to lead people to the point of repentance. But the presuppositionalists, will, they love this verse because they'll say this verse says repentance actually has to come first before the knowledge of the truth. They have to repent and confess and submit to the existence of God before they can actually be honest with the evidence and come to the knowledge of the truth. So really interesting arguments, at least just, you know, whether you disagree uh, with, you know, their hostility toward these other approaches or not, man, I think, I think this is really a helpful tool to just put in your tool belt. The rest of the class is yours. We have six minutes. So any comments or questions about any of that, what that might look like in a real life scenario, uh, Tom and then Chris, or go ahead, Chris and then Tom. <clears throat> yeah, so the morality argument, you know, how do we know can one meat bag shoot a hole in another meat bag? And, and I've always avoided using that argument as a Christian because it just seems to make the atheists mad. Because the response is always, well, what do you mean I can't have morality if I don't believe in God? Of course I have morality. I mean, I'm a human being. I'm a good person. I know what that means to be a good person. I know what it means to, to have morality. And, and, and I think for the first time for me, this approach kind of validates that point. You can have morality. You're right. right? right. You agree with them. Right? When they say, no, we can have morality just because we're atheists doesn't mean we, like, I know that you can. 
but you're borrowing that from the Christian worldview. You're, you're treating this as a moral and immoral situation. You can't do that on your worldview. So what we're doing is we're trying to help the atheists see the way that they live and the way that they speak is inconsistent with their worldview un that undergirds it. Okay, that, that's what we're trying to show them. That like, look, your worldview doesn't, doesn't allow you to, to talk like this, to talk about trusting your reason and to condemn things as immoral. So bring your worldview, let's bring your worldview into line with God's and then everything will be aligned, right? And then you can, yeah, then you can actually uh, have a basis, an ultimate justification for these things. Tom? Chris's comments remind me of the old uh, drawing of the, the man sitting on the limb, sawing off the limb that he's on mm. because it's con con connected to the life and the, the strength of the, of the tree. Mm. Um, logic and wisdom cannot be disassociated from God. They are present and active because he is. They're eminences from him. They're not a separate thing from him. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard to argue against that. Yeah, I mean, it's, that's, it is really hard to argue against that. Otherwise, it's just random. Just how in the world is it that these invisible, universal, transcendent laws apply to every single person? And we can use our brains and come to logical conclusions together. That just sort of happened by chance through, through evolution. It, there's not much basis for using that to justify it. Uh, Steve, do you have one? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, number one, I'd like to uh, thank you for finally identifying, uh, helping me to identify myself as a priest oppositionalist, I suppose. Hey, all right. I, uh, <laughs> Very good. Able to I knew there was one of you in here. No. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I've always been rather comfortable being the odd man out. So. Uh, yeah, as you were going through those four uh, reasonings behind uh, w the problems with the first three approaches, as we've called them, the reason I, I kind of came to this on my own over time. Uh, these these discussions always fascinated me. It doesn't matter uh, how interested someone was in these. I, I would quite often bring this stuff up when I was younger with uh, friends and. That kind of distinguished who I was going to be friends with. Mm -hmm. um, and over time, while I personally found a lot of the, uh, the classes, as I, you know, as I grew up here in this congregation, very, very powerful, uh, the evidences classes and things like that, I appreciated them very much. Sure. And I found that they made virtually no impact mm -hmm. on any friend that wasn't already predisposed mm -hmm. to be a Christian, mm -hmm. uh, to, to have that mindset. And so I kind of came to these, especially that fourth point. Um, uh, uh, that, that lack of evidence isn't their problem. It, yeah, yes, yes, yeah. thank you. Um, I found that it, it didn't matter you know, how, how well I'd memorized you know, these, these ideas and these concepts and these facts. Sure. It, it just didn't make a dent mm -hmm. in their you know, determination in, in their worldview. Yeah. And so over time, I kind of developed some of these, these thought processes myself. I never sure. realized they were called that, but I've come to it kind of based on necessity. Mm -hmm. that, and that's why I have far fewer of those conversations nowadays, because I know if I bring this kind of stuff up, this is where I will go. And mm -hmm. the conversation will not go very far if, you know, if we do not come to agreement on these concepts. I just, I just don't bother anymore. Yeah. Yeah, Unless sure. I think there will be fruit coming from it. Sure. Yeah, and, so. and everybody's different. It's like some, some Christians now can say, like, well, I was an atheist, and somebody presented me evidence. I, I didn't think there was any evidence for Christianity. They presented me the evidence, and I was like, wow, that's amazing. Like, that happens all the time, even today. So, so that's why I, I would never say, like, don't use evidence for your conversation with atheists, because it can actually change people. But, but it is, it's a matter of the heart. And I think it's cool to have this in our tool belt, too, because... Maybe you try some evidence and you're like, oh, everything I bring up, they just throw it in my face as, you know, not being very persuasive. Well, then how about let's try this approach, all right? Let's talk about what persuasion means and do you even have a basis for, you know, persuasiveness in your worldview? Uh, so anyway, yeah, 20 more seconds. I don't see anybody else's hands for 20 seconds. That's, 
not going to be worth it probably. Um, it'll take 20 seconds just to get the mic to you. So, <laughs> uh, Thank you guys so much. If you, if you want further information about this, just let me know. I can point you to books that are helpful and um, YouTube videos and things like that about this approach. But many, many who use this approach on YouTube are Calvinists. So just you know, be careful because a lot of it's just very, very Calvinistic, the ones that use this approach. Just be careful of that while you're watching the videos so that you don't adopt some of their you know, false doctrines. All right, thank you guys so much.